Welcome everyone. We're just waiting some moments to give viewers a chance to log on and join us before we get started. Okay, we're gonna get started. We have viewers logged on. Welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Juvenile Dispersion and Survival of the Cenarius Vulture in Portugal with Alfonso Godino of the Spanish NGO Acción por el Mundo Salvaje, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary Research Associate and 2008 Hawk Mountain leadership trainee. Welcome, Alfonso. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to all. My name is Jamie Dawson, and I am the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. We are so glad that you are joining us today for this program. Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey, and we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, we thank you so very much for your continued support. And if you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges. And we are thrilled to offer our local and global community a variety of free virtual programming. As always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. At any point during today's program, viewers may submit questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. We've designated time at the end of the program to take some questions from the audience. And we are so excited that Alfonso Godino is joining us today, all the way from Spain, just on the border of Portugal, to, yeah. <laughs> teach, us, to teach us about the Cenarius vultures in Portugal. And this gentleman is a raptor enthusiast for sure. And I'd like to take a moment to share some of his extensive background experience with our audience before we get started. Alfonso started working with raptors in 1996 in the Bearded Vultures Reintroduction Project in Southern Spain. Throughout the next 12 years, Alfonso was involved in many vulture research projects, including ringing Cenarius vulture nestlings in Spain, satellite tracking of the bearded vulture in Drakensberg National Park, South Africa, and bearded vulture survey populations in Morocco. During the autumn of 2008, Alfonso spent three months as a leadership trainee at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. And after this training period started a new page of life working with a step bird, the Hubara Bustard in Morocco, and the Asian Hubara Bustard in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. In 2010, Alfonso returned to Europe to coordinate a conservation project for the Cenarius Vulture in southern Portugal. In 2015, Alfonso joined the Spanish NGO Acción por el Mundo Salvaje, where he currently works in Spain. This NGO is responsible for the main wildlife rescue center in Southwest Spain. Here, Alfonso had the opportunity to create new raptor conservation studies focusing on the griffin, cenarius vulture, lesser kestrel, raptor electrocution, and identifying threats of the red kite. Currently, Alfonso is working on a new project to reintroduce the red kite in Southern Spain. Alfonso is also a Hawk Mountain Sanctuary Associate Researcher. Bravo, bravo, Alfonso, <laughs> um, for the Cenarius Vulture Project in Portugal, as well as studying heavy metal exposition on raptors with the toxicology department 
of Mercia University. Alfonso is also a member of the Vulture Specialist Group and the Survival Species Commission of the IUCN. Wow, Alfonso, your raptor experience is extensive, it's impressive, you're clearly so passionate. What inspired you to work with raptors? Well, uh, apparently, at the beginning, it was uh, an accident. I worked with uh, ducks in wetlands, and I hate raptors. But my, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. But my boss told me, or oh, you go to work to a raptor project, or you finish your contract. So I went to work with raptor, but not very happy. But uh, after discovered the biology, the amazing uh, situation of some of them, and the critical situation of some of them was really, really a huge impact on me and uh, decided to focus of my professional life in this group of birds and uh, mainly on vultures. Wow. So let's travel back in time to 2008 when you first became involved with Hawk Mountain. How did you, uh, doing all this work over across the Atlantic Ocean, how did you become involved with Hawk Mountain Sanctuary? Well, again, my, my connection always with uh, Hawk Mountain has been like uh, a joint of huge, huge casualties. I met uh, uh, Dr. Keith Bilstein during a uh, Congress here in Spain, and I told to him that I was interested to train, especially on GIS for tracking a uh, Raptor with satellite transmitter. And uh, he told me, yes, uh, write to me an email and we will see. And uh, fortunately, I, I was selected to go there. And uh, it was uh, three amazing months for me, personally and professionally. And uh, my advice is that uh, all people able to go there for internship, apply, 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 because it's a lovely place with a lovely staff. They will take care of you. Oh, thank you. And I, uh, I'd like to share with the audience that while you were at Hawk Mountain in the United States, you developed a love of the Kit Kat chocolate bar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was... Uh, it was a very sweet experience. <laughs> yes. So how did your experience at Hawk Mountain for the leadership uh, traineeship impact your life? Yeah, for me, the more important was that uh, that time in Hawk Mountain opened to me the gate to the world of satellite, satellite tracking. Actually, satellite tracking and uh, GPS devices are uh, a very important tool to study and conservation raptors. So for me, it was uh, the way to, to open this, uh, this new window to an amazing uh, world and, of course, to uh, many, many new projects, thanks to the training I, I got there. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Alfonso, we are ready. We are excited to learn about the Cenarius <laughs> vulture in Portugal. So I'm going to turn it over to you. So thank you. Okay. So... Here we go. And now, now we are in Portugal. Well, uh, first of all, to many, many thanks to Hawk Mountain to support, to offer me the opportunity to show the results of this study. And of course, to be a, an important partner in this, uh, in this project. Hey, let me check a second. Yeah. Well, we are going to speak about uh, vultures. The Cinerogen vulture is uh, a big vulture, but there are many, many other vultures around the world. They used to occur in all the continent, but uh, not in Australia, unfortunately. But they are, we have, uh, for example, condor and, uh, and black vultures in, uh, in all uh, America and South America. We have the lapid faced vulture in Africa, the bearded vulture who occurs in several uh, continents, and endangered uh, species of vulture in, in India. Here we have a small uh, view of uh, all the vulture species in the world. You can see there are 23 species in the world, seven in uh, North and South America, and uh, 16 in the old world, in Africa, Asia, and, uh, and Europe. Some of them have, uh, oh, sorry, some of them have, uh, are endemic, as uh, the Cape Reef and Vulture, Others have a wide uh, distribution in the world, as the Egyptian vulture, the bearded vulture, even the synergy vulture, 
they have population from uh, Europe until uh, China. But uh, all this huge uh, group of raptor is not uh, out of uh, the thread of many, many raptor in the world. Vultures are the group more threat of raptor in the world. Here, if we see the number of uh, vulture critically endangered or endangered is the higher in the planet. So we are working and we are studying with uh, critical species that uh, we have to study and protect in the future because for some of them, the situation is really not uh, safe for the future. Well, now coming back to Europe, if uh, in, in the old world, Africa, Asia, and Europe, we have uh, 16 vulture species. In Europe, we have uh, four. We have uh, the Cinereus vulture at the top on the left, the Egyptian vulture, the Griff a Russian griffon vulture, and the bearded vulture. These are the four species of uh, vulture we have in, in Europe. But uh, Europe, even uh, when it's a huge area with many countries, vulture are not widespread in this continent. As we can see, all the species present in Europe has a very, very narrow distribution. If we can see on the left at the top, the Cinereus vulture, 97% of the European population is in Spain with uh, almost around 3,000, a little bit more than 3,000 breeding pairs in Europe. 97% of this population is uh, in Spain. About the Egyptian vulture on the right at the top, this uh, white vulture, it's the same, uh, almost the half of the population in Europe 1,500 breeding pairs are in uh, the Iberian Peninsula. About the, the birdie vulture, we are in the same situation. It's uh, around 75% of the population is in Spain. And with the Griffin vulture, 95% of the European population is in the Iberian Peninsula. So we can see that the Iberian Peninsula, which uh, has two countries, Spain and Portugal, are the most wonderful place for vultures in, in this continent. And they have the responsibility, to con the responsibility to conserve this vulture for the future because they keep the main vulture population in this continent. And well, here we have the, the main vulture of uh, our presentation, the Cinereus vulture. It's one of the bigger, biggest raptor in the world. It's almost uh, three meters uh, wingspan. And uh, the distribution of the Cinereus vulture is one of the vultures with a wider distribution in the world. They have population from Spain until uh, South Korea in uh, East Asia. And we can see that they have a small population in Spain, another population in Turkey and the Caucasian countries, and the mainly population is in Central Asia. Normally, the, uh, the the Cinereus vulture is not a migratory bird, but only in some continents. In Spain, it's not that he is, it, it is, sorry, a, a migratory species in uh, the Caucasian and in Asia. They used to winter in, uh, in the South Asia from the breeding co colonies or breeding population, which are mainly in China, Mongolia, and uh, Uzbekistan and Central Asia. But uh, they are in Spain, by the other side, they are not migratory birds. They don't, they don't make this uh, typical movement of migration north-south. And well, this is the habitat of the Cinereus vulture in, uh, in, in the Iberian Peninsula. They like uh, forest areas, uh, not very high. They don't like uh, high altitudes with uh, dense vegetation. And uh, they used to breed in slope where they build the nest at the top of the trees. But this is not the same point of view of the breeding population of the large vulture. In Asia, the situation is quite different. We can find in, in Asia the scenario of vulture in semi-desert and steppe areas. They breed uh, even on the ground and in, in rocky, uh, in small rockies or rocks in a slope. And they also breed twin trees. But uh, as you can see, it's a very flexible bird that is able to live in very forestry areas in, uh, in Europe, but too in uh, semi arid or semi steppe areas in, in Central Asia. Well, 
the Cinerius vulture is not uh, a species with uh, I am an important sexual dimorphism, 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 sorry. The female and males are quite similar. Female, females are a little bit uh, bigger than males, but this difference is not, uh, we cannot appreciate the difference in the field when you watch uh, Cinerius vultures alone. Normally, uh, the female, when they are together, you can identify, but if they are alone, it's, it's really difficult. We have, uh, the Cinerius vulture has uh, different in, uh, in color with the age. You can see on the left, uh, an adult used to have the hair uh, greenish or a little bit white and the body feathers are brown or brownish. And the juvenile, they have the hair completely black and the feathers of the hair are black and the body and the feather body, the, the color used to be dark, black, darker than, than adults. Uh, it's quite e easy to identify the age and between uh, the first uh, younger, the juvenile bird, and uh, juvenile but subadult, and but later when they are adult, this uh, is almost impossible. Well, uh, this is the distribution of the Cinerius vulture in uh, in Spain, as we we were talking is the, the main population of, of Europe. The distribution of the Cinerius vulture is in the south uh, west uh, quarter, because all these uh, brownish spots are uh, the area where the colony are distributed. And this uh, two point, the two red triangle in the, in the north of the country, here and here, these are two rental action projects they are running actually, one, the one on the on the east is uh, finished, and the one on the west is uh, still uh, running. So uh, the population of uh, Cineris vulture in the Iberian Peninsula uh, is focused in this area in Spain. In Portugal, uh, it was extinct uh, during the second half of the 20th uh, century. Mainly, uh, the extinction was similar to the the persecution was one of the main uh, reasons, uh, shooting, poisoning too, and uh, mainly habitat destruction. But, uh, well, in 2010, again, the Bled scenario vulture came back to Portugal as uh, a British species. We suppose that the new recolonization of the scenario vulture in Portugal is really linked to the Spanish colonies. If we see here, this uh, graphic, we, we can see the huge increasing of uh, the Cineris Volta population in, in Spain, mainly Extremadura region, is, this is this region in the, in the west of Spain, in which in uh, 40 years from 100 breeding pairs, they have actually is, uh, almost 1,000. So they increase the population really, really in a very, very huge area, but no, sorry, not the, the increase the, the number of, uh, of birds, but they didn't increase the, the range of the colony. So the huge growing of the population in Spain from uh, two, three hundred breeding pair until the 3,000 breeding pair counted actually, uh, actually is uh, they are mainly in the same colony. So there is only one or two new colonies, but this huge increase in the almost uh, half century has been an increase of the, the old colonies detected uh, in 1917. So as uh, you can see, these uh, red circles are the main colonies in, in Spain. Only this circle have more than the half of population in, uh, in Spain. And we suspect that in this case, the colony, the new, colonization in Portugal, the origin came from uh, Spanish colonies. In this case, in, in 2010, was the colony, the first colony uh, recognized in Portugal. It was in Tejo International National Park. The second one was in the north in 2012. And it was only uh, an isolated breeding pair and still is there. So there is no increasing as uh, happened in, uh, in Tejo International National Park. And the last colony was in the south in 2015, that a new colony established there. And as you can see, 
in the colonies from Tejo and in the south, both colonies are really close to other big and traditional colonies. So we suspect that the increase, the recolonization, the recolonization of uh, the scenarios voter in Portugal is absolutely linked to the increasing of population in Spain. This, uh, the other colony, the one in the north, uh, because it's uh, far away from uh, from the colony, it has no an increase of population as the the other ones in the south had during this uh, ten or and five years. So the philopatric behavior is uh, in which uh, raptor and vulture used to came to breed to the colony where the, they came from, even after six or seven years. So maybe that uh, is possible that the Spanish colonies, when the nestling came back to the colonies, was uh, a very dense population. So they tried to spread, they tried to, to look for other areas with less density to, ab to avoid competition with other breeding pair. And in this process, when they extend the colony to the, to the west, they returned and they came to Portugal to create these two, two colonies. So the conservation of the scenarios voter in Portugal is not only a Portugal or, or Spanish, it's not only a, a national task, it's an international task because these populations are connected in between, in between them. And well, what do we know about the scenarios voters in Portugal? Uh, unfortunately, since uh, previously to start our project, the only information we have we had about uh, this species in Portugal was the, the monitoring of the of the breeding population of the breeding three of these three colonies. So, uh, unfortunately, we have a few information when uh, we start to work. And why we decide to start a project with the synergy vulture in Portugal? Well, first, because it's a, a new population which is increasing. So we would like to know how is the process of uh, recolonization of the main colony in Portugal, the one in, uh, in Tejo International Park, is in the center, of, in, the, in the center, in the border of Spain, in the center of the country. And uh, we would like to get information about uh, some aspects of the biology of raptors and vultures in particular uh, to apply to the conservation of these uh, colonies of, and this recent uh, population. And we have this situation when uh, we started the, our project, one breeding pair in the north, 24 breeding pair. Well, this, this information is uh, updated until now. So in 2020, we have uh, one breeding pair in the north, 24 breeding pairs in the colony we have been working and we are working actually, and 10 breeding pairs in the colony in the south. So it's a small population of less than 40 breeding pairs. And uh, we want it to, and we want to study what is the limitant factor and the conservation of this uh, population. Well, this is uh, the Tejo International River. Uh, you have, uh, is the, the border in between uh, Spain and Portugal. You have Spain on the right and uh, Portugal on the left. And the colony we have been studying is uh, the one uh, situated, located in the left side of the, of the river, in the western side of the, of the river. So in uh, 2018, uh, thanks to this uh, couple of uh, people on, on the corner, it's Otilia and Sergio, they are a technician of the National Park and they have been during many years uh, monitoring the population, the breeding population, but they have no information. They have no additional information, only the counting of the breeding pairs. So they contacted me to try to help them uh, to study and uh, improve the acknowledgement of the scenarios vulture in the, this colony in Portugal, the main colony in Portugal. And well, we mount a task force in which, of course, Hog Mountain was uh, involved. It was involved to the Institute for uh, Nature Conservation and Forest, uh, that is the Wildlife Authority in Portugal. Of course, the, the Tejo International Park. The electric company Endesa, who support, have been supporting this project from the beginning, and uh, the Toxicology Department of uh, Murcia University. So we create this uh, group to increase the, the technology and the conservation of the, the scenarios vulture in, in, in this colony in Portugal. 
Well, what we did at the beginning, well, uh, our main goal was uh, to equip with a GPS uh, transmitter as many juvenile as uh, possible. And uh, thanks to the work developed previously by Otilia and Sergio, we have uh, very good information about the lo location of the nest, but sometimes to reach the nest and to coach uh, the nestling was not an, an easy task. But well, um, as you can see here, we, we target with uh, GPS transmitter uh, eight births in 2018, six births in 2019, and seven births this year. Maybe maybe some birth, births more because as you can see, a W it means uh, birth target in the nest or so nestling, and uh, RC it means that they are birth from a rescue center. Every year when we we go to the colony to tag the bird. We found a starved animal in the internet, some of them injured, and we have to take this bird and uh, remove and bring them to a rescue center. So normally after a short period, that will be between two and three months, this bird are able again to be released to the, released to the wild, and uh, we equip them too with the GPS to know the survival and to get information about the the movement of this animal that they came from the colony, but they have been uh, several months in the rescue center. So we we equip the the vulture with a small uh, GPS. It's a uh, very very light. It's less uh, 50 grams. So for a weight of this uh, bird that we target them with seven kilograms, but they can reach even 10 grams. So the negative impact on this bird due to the transmitter is uh, zero. And well, we have here the first information about the movement of the Cinerius vulture in, uh, in Portugal. This is uh, the first time that the, this kind of study has been uh, done in, in the country and uh, was uh, one of our main uh, goals to get this information. Here we can see that the, the, there is no uh, similar uh, behavior in in the nestling, you can see that this is this movement are from different uh, birds and from the same year. So this uh, bird were target on the same year, and uh, you can see the how different is the movement that the, they do during the first year of juvenile dispersion. Well, we have birds as the the first one at the top on the left that they move a lot. They, sorry, they move not uh, far away from the colony, less than sorry, they move less than uh, 50, 60 kilometers from, from the colony. You can see this uh, two animal, two, two vulture, that they are really close to the colony. The colony is the, the green quarter. So they move really, really few kilometers from the colony. The, this is uh, the first one. This is a bird from the, from the nest. And this is one of the birds from uh, the rescue center. So you can see that the movement are quite similar. We have two, another bird who have, they, they move more than the, the previous bird, more than seven kilometers, but less than 250 kilometers from, uh, from the colony. And we have other behavior that they move a lot. They move more than 700 kilometers from the colony and one of them even reaching crossing uh, Spain, Portugal, even reaching the south of France. Uh, so 750 kilometers away from the colony is the maximum distance that you will scenario have uh, moved from the colony in, in our study. This is the total area in which all the nestling have been uh, moving. They, they have, you see this uh, green spot, is a very intensive area, which they have been, they used to be uh, most of the time or very frequently. And the total area, the, the white spot is the total area in which they have spread and in which they have been moving during the first year of uh, juvenile dispersion. It's a uh, more than 250,000 kilometers square, the, the area in which uh, these uh, birds have been uh, moving. 
And well, uh, as I told you before, it's uh, an international uh, project because uh, birth can get a move in, in both countries, even in between Spain and Portugal, and a little bit in the south of uh, France. Well, this is a, a small abstract about uh, the information we have collected during this uh, two years information. The nestling of this year is still are in, in the nest or they are just uh, leaving the nest in, during these uh, days. But uh, they move the maximum distance is uh, almost 800 kilometers from, from the nest. The total home range is a little bit more than 200,000 kilometers square. We have uh, detected different uh, behavior of, uh, have, been have been watching previously. And uh, we have detected too that they have a behavior of excursion. So they are, they are benefit of philopatric, even this, those birds who travel thousands of kilometers, uh, hundreds of kilometers away, sorry, they used to come back to the colony. So in some birds we have detected an excursion behavior in which uh, they leave the colony. It's like, uh, I'm going to search if I found a lovely or better place to, to be. But after a few days, uh, no more than normally two or three weeks, they come back uh, to the colony. So they, they feel, and this is the philopatric behavior, a strong attraction for the natal uh, colony. We have detected too that the, the, they leave the nest, uh, or they, yeah, they leave the nest, jump the nest from just now, so in, 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 at the end of September. They spend until the end of uh, the year, until December, really close to the colony. Uh, sometimes uh, now, to, from now until the next weeks uh, in front, they are not able to fly uh, properly. So they spend a lot of time in the ground. Fathers, uh, the parents came to feed them on the ground, but they are not still able to, to follow them to search for food. So this uh, period in which we are now is uh, critical for them because we have recorded, as we will see later, some mortality events. And uh, just in late October and November, they are able to follow the father, the, the parents, uh, to learn, uh, especially, and to search for, for food. In uh, the next spring, the, the, the first spring of uh, their lives, this is the, the spring of the second year of life, those birds who start the big movement is uh, when they move. So they, they are close to the colonies uh, until the spring, and during the spring, they go away, they, far, they, they travel far away. So they spend normally the spring and the summer out of the colonies, and even those birds who have been traveling for long distance, they come back in autumn to the colony and they, they used to spend the rest of the time there. So it will be interesting to see what the, they will do in the next uh, year, if they stay there or they, or they, they move more. About the, the use of the spay, we have detected several areas in which uh, they used to go frequently. It's like if uh, in this, uh, during the time they spend learning with the parents, and this excursion that they do when they are apparently independent, it seems that they are looking for points of uh, huge interest for them. And they repeat, and in this uh, excursion behavior, they when they detect a good area, they repeat frequently to go to these places that sometimes are in between uh, 70 kilometers until 200 kilometers. We have identified these areas and uh, we have identified that they love to go to other colonies. We suspect that they use the colonies as an information point. So they go to other colonies to contact with other birds and try to use them to find food. They choose to, uh, and they select very positively, uh, areas with high density of food, mainly in Spain we have, uh, and Portugal, we have a, a way to, to breed the livestock. They are, they are semi-wild, so there are many, many carcass there. And these areas where there is a, a high probability to find food, 
are really, really selected by vulture. So when, when they found that they have an erratic movement, but when they found one of these areas, they repeat, repeat, and go again to these areas, even when they came back to the colony. Other areas that they, they have been visiting during this period, during this period, have been a vulture restaurant. So they are a fenced area in which uh, NGO or the government uh, bring food for vulture conservation. So the juvenile are really, really good to detect this uh, easy way to get, uh, to get food because some of them are provided by food uh, every week. So they recognize very, very fast this point and travel to them pretty frequently. And unfortunately, one of the points we have detected thanks to the GPS is that vulture used to visit uh, rabbit's dam. Uh, at the beginning, we believed that this, stop, uh, this visit there was something uh, occasional, so not very frequently, or not very frequent, but uh, with time we are detecting that, that uh, some individual used to go frequently to this uh, dangerous places for them because food there is not the proper food for the vulture and they can be exposed to some contamination and uh, some interesting uh, fray that we are we have been detecting now and that uh, we hope to develop in in the future well about the, not only the movement of uh, the juvenile was uh, one of our goals, but uh, for us uh, it was important to identify the threat, why and where this uh, vulture died. Well, uh, at the beginning, uh, we've, we have found, I'm um, from the beginning, sorry, we have found a uh, high mortality of nesting just in that period that I was speaking before. Just when they leave the nest, they spend on the ground from several weeks, and in this time they are really, really exposed to predation. We suppose uh, by wild boar. So uh, in this uh, situation, we have found uh, two juvenile died in 2018, one juvenile in 2019, and this year just a few weeks. Uh, after tagged the nestling, uh, we found, thanks to the GPS, uh, the rest of the body we feed it one of, and con the remainder of the park confirmed that the, the juvenile was uh, predated. And uh, we have another another uh, kind of threat in which we were to more interested because we could try to to reduce and to correct this threat is that the human threat. So. The scenario vulture have uh, the main threat for the species is uh, poisoning, is a uh, collision or electrocution with power lines and uh, wind farms. Sometimes no, the scenario vulture and many, many raptors are really, have, they have serious problems with uh, the wind farms. In this case, in, in our project, we have detected two juvenile died. One uh, was injured. Uh, by a collision with a power line. Uh, it was not there. Uh, we were able to rescue thanks to the GPS because we, we detect the signal that uh, was not there, but spent uh, a couple of days without flight. And we sent there the ranger. They were able to collect and trap uh, the bird and bring, bring to the rescue center. Unfortunately, this bird uh, had a broken wing and uh, it was not able to rehabilitate and release again. So it will be a bird to, who will keep in captivity for, for the life, for the entire life. We found another bird died, the uh, collision of two. In this case, it was uh, dead. Uh, we suspect with a fence in a, in a farm. It was a farm with a lot of uh, livestock, with many livestock, many, many food. Uh, a huge uh, food availability and we suspect that the bird flying or uh, flying down on the ground uh, impact with a uh, fence and uh, broke the wind. We were not able to find it alive and as uh, you can see here the ranger of the national park uh, until the suspect of another potential cause of death uh, collect uh, the carcass to, to the laboratory. This animal died uh, 
200 kilometers from the colony in the case of the, the, the bird. And the one in Jury was really close to the colony, less than uh, 100 kilometers. Well, and this is one of other of the three uh, that we have been uh, getting. If we were uh, we were very interested. I suppose that uh, that uh, some of you uh, here before or know about the collapse of uh, vulture uh, population in in South Asia due to the diclofenac. It's an anti-inflammatory drug used for livestock but uh, it's mortal for uh, vultures, mainly for vulture from jeeps groups. The leaf poisoning, is it was another threat that we were interested in. Maybe that the more media uh, <laughs> situation was with the Californian condor, because was, uh, the Californian condor is, was one of the more endangered species in the world, and the leaf contamination was one of the main still is one important threat for the survival of the species. But not only for the Californian condor, uh, you can see here, all the raptor or most of the raptor population have been investigating and uh, have been uh, uh, studied to detect the lead contamination. Most of them have showed an exposition to this contaminant, which uh, will have uh, lethal effects for them. And, uh, well, it was one of the the, the three that we we tried to search to in in our study. Well, uh, as you can see, all the bird we we trapped to equip with GPS, we took blood and uh, feeder samples to study heavy metals, antibiotic and uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. During the first year, we we try to study only lead and cadmium, but uh, due to the result we get in 2018, we increased the number of heavy metal in our study. So we have uh, seven uh, heavy metals. Uh, we are studying now seven heavy metal, lead, cadmium, zinc, mercury, arsenic, and copper. Five antibiotics, five antibiotic, and five uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, unfortunately, we found uh, the contamination of lead and cadmium in birth of uh, 2018, only lead in 2019, and now we are still uh, analyzing the result for, of this year. Uh, we found a few level of antibiotic in 2018, and uh, we didn't found uh, antibiotic during 2018, and we didn't find antibiotic or anti-inflammatory drugs in 2019. So apparently the, the main contaminant, uh, the main exposition we have found was uh, lead and cadmium. Uh, for us, it was a huge surprise to find lead because normally lead contamination came from the ammunition using for hunting. So during the period in which we took the sample of the vulture was uh, in uh, summer, so there is no hunting, it's forbidden. And for us, it was a surprise to find this level of contamination, mainly lead and cadmium in this uh, nestling. And uh, this, you can see, this is, uh, we came back to this map. Uh, the brownish spots are the scenario vulture colonies in Spain, the yellow one, is the colony we have been studying during this year. And this, unfortunately, is uh, each uh, black point on the right map is a veterinary store or a veterinary clinic in which the Clofenac was able to sell. So farmer in Spain can buy the Clofenac. Unfortunately, it's not forbidden. It was banned in Spain. Even when Spain hosts more than 90% of vulture population in Europe, and uh, we have been, we, ha we watched the impact of diclofenac on vulture in, uh, in Asia, in uh, India, and we have this risk here. So if you can see, this is one of the main areas for the Cinerius vulture in Europe, and it's quite similar to this area with uh, a high density of, uh, of uh, storage 
detected with uh, diclofenac available for farmer. So we still maintain that diclofenac is a risk, even when when has not been detected yet, but uh, we will use this information as a, a control to alert in case to detect diclofenac because in fact is uh, available, unfortunately. Well, and after all, all these uh, two years and a half and um, three uh, nesting campaign, we have, what have we learned? We will ask again to George, maybe we can get uh, more information and by his face, I think that uh, he's happy with the information we, we have collected. Well, the main information we have, uh, we got is that uh, we know that the nestling leave the nest in, in September. They used to be close to the colony until uh, December. We, have, uh, we, we found no difference of behavior uh, from birth uh, from the nest with a natural uh, behavior with their parents and birth uh, rescue and release from rescue center. So apparently the protocol we use in the rescue center are appropriated because behavior of the bird after release is similar to the, the ones, the vultures in, in the wild. And we have found different behavior on juvenile dispersion. There is no uh, a common uh, behavior for, for the nesting of this colony. And uh, they, have, they choose different strategies to, to move during the dispersion. Unfortunately, we detected a high mortality during the first year of life, depending on the year in between, reach in between 25 and 50% of the nestling died during the first year. This is a very impressive number, but uh, in vultures, in bear raptors, uh, this uh, percentage is, uh, is safe for the population if the adult survival is uh, guaranteed. So vultures are adapted to this, uh, to, to maintain population with this high mortality, even, even more. One of the problems we have, uh, and we are really, really worried, is uh, uh, the detection of lead and cadmium in this uh, nestling. And as I told before, out of the hunting season. So for us now it's a huge challenge to try to detect where the, they get this lead and cadmium and try to, to correct or to cut this uh, exposition. The small pressing of antibiotic detected is something positive. Uh, because uh, farmers used to use uh, in livestock uh, farms uh, different antibiotic, and uh, we are too happy to didn't found uh, uh, anti-inflammatory, especially diclofenac. But we will have to keep it eye, the eyes uh, on because uh, diclofenac is there, as you seen previously. It's possible to buy diclofenac, and the risk for a uh, vulture population is uh, is really high. Well, and what we want to do, or, or what's better, what we would like to do for the future to, to study and conserve this population. Well, still the, the, the GPS devices will continue uh, giving us information about the movement, so we will learn more about the movement of the birds. Only way we have uh, been watching here is during the third year of life, so now we will get more information about what they do what they do and especially when they will insert in the breeding population so we, we are very interested to know when they will be part of the breeding population how many of these juvenile will uh, be adults in the future as uh, previously i say we are uh, absolutely interested and will be one of our main a research line in the future is to, to get information where they get the lead contamination. Because as people to say, uh, exposition to lead in during the winter and autumn is quite common because the hunting season. So the hunter used to is, uh, we, they use bullets with uh, lead. So when they shoot uh, the red deer or the wild boar, some of these animals uh, are not able uh, run away because the, and they, they are later hunter are not able to to collect this animal and vultures uh, will uh, eat later so they will eat this small piece of uh, lead contamination and 
we know that the level of lead are common or quite common during the hunting season in autumn and the winter, but not during June, July. And uh, we can control the, the lead during the hunting season because we can promote the change to other non-toxic uh, toxic ammunition, but we have no idea where this lead contamination came during the end of the summer. So it will be one of the main tasks we will have in the future. Uh, we would like to use this uh, population as uh, a control colony. So if, if we are able to continue uh, getting sample of uh, antibiotic and anti-inflammatory, in case someday, unfortunately, we hope we don't need or we don't, we don't want to detect this uh, toxic or these uh, drugs, but we, we would like to use the colony as a, a sentinel to detect these, uh, these drugs. So if we are able to collect and many, many samples every year, uh, we will be able to detect in case that uh, some of the adults will be exposed to, to these drugs. Of course, we, we have many, many information with the juvenile population, but uh, we would like and we will love a lot to start to get information about the adult population. Uh, vultures, if we want to conserve, uh, conserve vulture, we must conserve and warranty the survival of adults. If we have a safe adult population, we can assume a high mortality of juvenile. So we want to get information now about uh, the adult, the survival, threat, and uh, especially if we have a transmitter on both juvenile and, and adult, to know better what is the link in between them when the independence of the juvenile starts and this is one of the, the new goals that we would like to implement in the future. Of course, uh, threat is quite important. Uh, we would like to know, we would like to get information about the poisoning, electrocution, collision, and toxicology. Because, uh, as I told you, if we are able to maintain in a safe and a good conservation state the uh, breeding population, the adult population, will be easier to, to preserve and and conserve uh, these populations. Well, and all this uh, huge effort during these uh, three years uh, could not be possible without the, the support of uh, Hawk Mountain, because uh, thanks to Dr. Keith Bistein and Bilstein and uh, Lori Goodrich, they have been supporting this project from the beginning, and they were the first uh, entity to support and I'm sure that uh, other organizations and the other uh, entities uh, will be, uh, they were more confident to support the project thanks to the presence of uh, Hawk Mountain. Of course, to the National Authority for Wildlife Conservation in Portugal, the National Institute for Nature and Forest Conservation. Thanks to them, the technician they have in the park, the ranger they have in the park, they have implemented a, a very good monitoring of breeding population and they make really, really easy all the process to and the project, implement the project to, to get this, the info we have been collecting during this year. A special thanks to Sergio and Otilia, the, the two person on the, on the right, because they have been the spirit of this project. And thanks to, to Endesa, the electric company who have been supporting the project, and thanks to, to the toxicology department of uh, Murcia University, because they have, they have been invested a huge effort to get information about the, to the toxicology. And well, here in Portugal, we collect uh, and we connect to with Hawk Mountain because this uh, lovely girl we have on the right is uh, Patricia Santos. She was uh, a trainee, uh, he, she was in Hawk Mountain, and thanks to Hawk Mountain, she contacted with us and asked about uh, if uh, she can join with us, uh, join with the project. And thanks to Hawk Mountain, she had the opportunity to collaborate with the project and still is in contact with us. So again, Hawk Mountain is uh, connecting people, not only raptors, all around the world. And thank you very much to all. Thank you to Hawk Mountain. And uh, well, I'm waiting for your question. Alfonso, thank you so much. That was a fabulous presentation.
Loved it. And it was so fun too to see Patricia's face there. So hi, Patricia. I think she is, <laughs> been, uh, I saw her joining us for, as a viewer. Um, so um, I have a question for you, Alfonso. What is your most favorite thing about studying Cenarius vultures in the wild? Well, for me, well, the more funny things is uh, to climb to the tree. It's oh. very, very funny. <laughs> but really, for the most exciting see, uh, scene for me has been uh, unfortunately discovered the, the exposition to toxicology they have. Uh, at the beginning, we were not uh, aware about that. But normally, I used to bring with me always when I, we are tagging bird a bed in case that something unfortunately happened. And they suggested to me, hi, Alfonso, could, can you give us some sample to collect information about toxicology? And I said, OK, let's go. And it was a, an amazing discovery and a, a potential uh, very big danger and threat for, for vultures. So for me, discovery at this point has been, uh, has been really, really impacting. Thank you. Sorry, I was responding to someone who had yeah. in. Um, okay, we have a question. What could be the reason for the different behaviors in the juvenile dispersion? Well, in raptors in general, uh, have been uh, detected uh, different in between sex. Uh, females used to travel longer than, than males, but in this case, we have not found any link because we have a female, we have males, we have bear from the rescue center, bear from the wild, and we have not been able to find uh, uh, a reason in which why if there is female travel more, male travel more, there is no, I think I need to get more information and more bears in the future to, to get an answer to, to this point. I'm sure that it could be linked to sex, but uh, we will must to research more in the future. Sounds like another project in the works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's see if there are any more questions. Uh, I have a question. Um, what is the public uh, perception of vultures in Spain and Portugal? Are people like, vultures are so awesome, or are people more like, oh, vultures? What's, what's the perception? Well, it depends. It depends where you move. If you move in cities, uh, people used to sing uh, vultures, ugly bird, always with that animal. But if you move to rural areas, they the perception they have is like uh, a friend because they clean all the dead animals in case of livestock uh, hunting areas. So they maintain the ecosystem really, really clean and uh, save a lot of money from the taxes. Uh, in some areas in Spain, they, there is a law in which you have to remove the dead uh, animal and uh, incinerate it to avoid any, any diseases. In case where the vultures do this job, they do free, safe, clean, and fast. Uh, there is an estimation, and only in Spain, from our taxes, we save two million of euro thanks to the service that Volter offered to us. So we are trying to show this information to people because sometimes people, as you say, hey, Volter are ugly, Volter. But maybe if they show them as a good friend for our package, maybe they will change the idea they have about Volters. I happen to think vultures are very attractive. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. are. Um, we have another question, and it's from Patricia. She says, hi, Alfonso and Jamie. It's great to see you. I have one question. You were talking about vultures going into dumpsters. Are you going to study that further? Do you think there are already negative consequences? Yep. Hi, Patricia. <laughs> Well, we have this week, we have just discovered the negative impact that uh, vulture go to the rubbish dump. We have uh, trapped one juvenile in the Spanish side of the colony, not in Portugal, but they are the, sa the same population. And this was a juvenile. This juvenile was uh, spent one week on the ground, not able to fly, and we collect them, uh, sometimes because the stress, they, they vomit the food they have in the crop. Well. I didn't show the picture in the presentation because they are really, really disgusting, but we collected many, many plastic, blue color, green color. So now we have been uh, 
we are now in the next year, we, we are going to search about the potential risk of this uh, food for a raptor of plastic. We suppose from one point, we suppose that in, in the pellets, they are going to be able to, to remove out the plastic. But the next year, the next year we are going to, to search for plastic contamination. We are, I was speaking yesterday with the toxicology lab and they are very interesting because there is no any study in this point about uh, in vultures. Wow. So we, we will do, Patricia. Good question. All right, I feel that might be the last question for now. Um, but if any more come in, um, I'll, I'll certainly read them. Um, Alfonso, again, thank you so much. Fascinating, and I love seeing your photos. Um, so great job for your presentation. Also, we had some comments come in to the questions. They were saying, great job, Alfonso, thank you. <laughs> so I'm relaying that to you from your fans in the audience. Um, thank you to our wonderful viewers for joining us today. Um, we're so happy we're able to connect virtually and, and share information with you. So thank you. Um, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary is open. Our trails are open. So please come visit us, check out our website. Tomorrow is a special day at Hawk Mountain. It's Monarch Day. We have lots of monarch activities going on throughout the day. Tomorrow is also our first autumn lecture series in our new outdoor amphitheater. We have Dr. LaDuc who will be presenting on uh, rattlesnake conservation in Pennsylvania. And that's at five o'clock PM. For our fall lecture series, some of them will be on site in the amphitheater and some of them will be virtually via Zoom. So just check our, our website for that. Um, we also have another on-site program coming up um, the following weekend on Sunday the 27th. We have Albatrosses of the World on Sunday afternoon at two o'clock. Virtual programs coming your way. Um, next Thursday the 24th, we have Sanctuary Storytime, Fidget's Folly at 11 o'clock a.m. And Fidget is a peregrine falcon, by the way. Um, Thursday, October 8th, um, we have a virtual fall lecture series, Mountain Lions Uncovering the Mystery, with Joshua Lisbon at 7 o'clock p.m. On Thursday, October 15th, and I was thinking about this a lot, Alfonso, when you were talking about um, the lead exposure and the threats um, uh, to vultures and condors. Um, we have lead exposure of North American raptors with Vincent Slave at seven o'clock p.m. So that's a really important conservation message there. And then on Thursday, November 12th, we have custodians of our ecosystem, women, raptors, and unsettling words with Diane Husick at seven o'clock p.m. So thank you everyone again. Much gratitude to you, Alfonso. You did a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and, you. Um, we hope to see everyone soon, either in person or virtually. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you.